If you can just pull back a little bit to smaller your head. For years now, we have seen NHL games played outdoors, but what if that became the norm, not a special event? And number four NHL teams are now talking about the possibility of not having a game outdoors, but multiple games, maybe not their whole schedule but maybe not just one or two either. Steve Milton, uh, good idea, reasonable idea, crazy idea. I think any idea right now is a good idea if you've got an idea and, and to chase it. Uh, I think what you would see is, is, is uh, what they call a law of diminishing returns. I think it'd be very exciting, the first one or two. And then you'd get to what has been happening a lot lately, which is maybe not as much excitement when you've had a, you had a game in your city before. So, uh, but you'd get the hardcore, and I think I think there's I think there's some meat on this bone. Well, you'd get some fans, right? I mean, that's the big problem yeah, right now. Something. Yeah, you'd, 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 get you'd get something. Yeah, you get something, and you get yeah. And you can't do anything right now. So, if you're a team that needs some money, hey, if we can put five thousand people in, that's better than zero people. Yeah, and well, it's, it's not a matter of if, if you need some money, guys. I mean, let's just face it here. Everybody needs money at this point in the National Hockey League. This league, like many other leagues, cannot go two complete seasons without having fans in the stands. So if you can, you know, if you're going to play in, a, in an arena, you can't put anyone in there because you can't socially distance. But if you play in a 60,000-seat stadium, you could probably get what you would normally get at a game, probably about 15,000, right? Because – and it's not a novelty. People will just show up because they want to see hockey. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some fans in some arenas. It'll it'll depend on, you know, COVID regulations, state to state, province to province, whatever the case is. But in outdoors, obviously, you're going to be able to fit a lot more fans. But I think this is going to be done out of necessity as opposed to novelty. We know that outdoor games have been a novel idea, that whether it's the Heritage Classic or, the, you know, the one on New Year's Day, whatever the case is. Uh, you know, more often than not, they're done because it's a novel idea, but they are a huge revenue generator as well. And that's going to be the key point is these outdoor games are going to generate the revenue that these teams have sorely lost. But is there a health factor here too? Can you sell the health factor? I mean, not just in the stands, but among the players and that kind of thing. It's the novelty. I mean, I, look, I, if you've been to an outdoor game, I've not been to one. I've watched a few of them, although I've become very quickly bored of them, but you know what you can't everything that's been told is you can't see the ice very well you can't see the play it's the novelty of being in the stadium and freezing and you know being with a huge crowd after I, I was I think it was Steve who said it after game two or game three or game four even the regulars are like you know what I'll watch it on tv I can't see it I can't see it so why am I going I think they'll move the uh, I think they'll change the configuration of, of how it's done it have to yeah you I think you'd especially in stadiums that have a bit of a corner to them I think you'd put it in the corner so you could have, you know, even though and not have 50 yards or, or how many yards it is uh, to, to two separate sides. But Bubba, wouldn't that defeat the whole purpose of having the giant stadium so you could get those people in there if you made it a smaller stadium? Yeah, but you're still getting more. You're getting people in there. I mean, again, I think as Rick said there, this isn't a novelty item. This is a necessity at this point. So people, if you again, get, can get 10,000 people in there, that's the revenue that you're missing completely and, and and i think this needs to be done and, and you know this is a great sort of uh, i think idea and i believe from what i'm hearing from i guess from like elliot freeman and uh, and pierre lebrun that it, it started off as four teams but you're looking at many american teams including the buffalo sabers that are looking at this option and to me this makes a lot of sense yeah i mean they're, they're not going to be allowed to fit 15 18 000 fans in an arena but they can do it in an outdoor venue so you're yeah. still going to get all that revenue, you can probably get all that merchandise sale when, you know, those fans are in those stadiums. Um, I, I think it's a big plus for those teams, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be enough. I mean, these budgets are $80 million. That's the cap and it's, and it's not moving, you know, up or down, but uh, it, the revenue is just not going to make any sense in terms of, you know, paying off all these expenses. Yeah. I think the, well, I think there's a, a revenue question about how much it costs to me. And that's why I think you might see four or five of them because, uh, how much does it cost to 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 set these things up and maintain? And, 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 and you, you got to taper that over more games. You don't want to do it for just one because you're not getting the forty thousand in there, and you're not getting the television. You're not getting a single date television money for it, like you did for for the for where it's a premium game. 
Uh, so you've got, there'll probably be some of that too, but I'll bet you what, in, I'll bet you this, coffees are going to be about $8. Well, <laughs> and I'll say one other thing that I think would be concerning for the league, and that is, you know, for Buffalo or Minnesota or someplace, if they were in the mix, it's one thing. Uh, but for credibility and competitive balance and for players not getting injured on horrible ice, I don't know that a lot of the teams ha- south of halfway down the States could, could credibly do this. Last weekend, against all odds, we saw Mike Tyson and Roy Jones Jr. fight. And when I say against all odds, not that they fought, but it was actually kind of entertaining. And more than that, Bubba, that Mike Tyson, not so much Roy Jones, but Mike Tyson looked pretty good. Could we see Mike Tyson say, enough with the entertainment stuff and get lured into a real fight with a real fighter anytime soon? I think this is going to happen. And, and, you know, I had no doubt that Mike Tyson was going to show up in shape. He was, I mean, the guy was not going to certainly embarrass himself. And as much as I think, you know, these guys got a little over a million dollars, him and Roy Jones to, to get this done. I, I believe that this is a platform for Mike Tyson right now to build his brand again, 54 years old. Uh, and you know what? There may be a, probably another old timer in there. We're already hearing about Lennox Lewis. We're hearing about Buster Douglas getting Holy back into shape. I mean, do, do, the, do people want to see this? They say no, but again, pretty much like myself, the night of the fight, I'm buying the fight. Bubba, they had over a million pay-per-view buys for this. They had four times more than they were anticipating in a best-case scenario. So, Rick, there's clearly an appetite for this somehow. Mike Tyson is still a hot commodity. We, we, whether you're a boxing fan or not, you're kind of, I mean, you know who Mike Tyson is. There's no doubt about it. So yeah, th- that interest, that intrigue, that, you know, what's going to happen type thing. I mean, he's, he's 50 plus. Whether he's fighting, you know, a Holyfield or a Douglas or a Lewis or whatever the case is, there's still that, it, it almost brings that kind of, you know, the memories of their past fights. I mean, how could it not? But at the end of the day, you know, it's two guys who are really still good at their craft despite their age uh, and, uh, you know, still a big name. And, and there's always that, you know, what's going to happen? Is he, is he going to bite another ear off? Is he going to, you know, go off? I don't think so, but you never know. He's only got a little time here, guys, uh, if he's got time at all. And, and uh, hey, I'm not that interested. I didn't want to watch the other one. It's, uh, but in, in the world we're living in today, and it was heading this way long before the pandemic of the pay-per-view and, a, and, the, and the oddball shows and, and those kinds of things, it, it, it can work. There's always a promoter out there that'll stake something. They'll find other ways to make money off it. Mike Tyson needs this. Uh, he's a reclamation project. Uh, he's, uh, he may or may not be really cuddly. I mean, this might be just uh, an unbelievably skin surface type of things. I won't watch it. Um, but I think it also speaks to the dearth of really good boxing in the heavyweight division that people are even thinking, well, maybe a real title, you know, re- maybe a real fight against somebody who's fighting and maybe one of the older guys that it's actually still fighting yeah, I think, for the heavyweight I mean, division I and super. Know. I can't I see think those guys do exist. And I think within the boxing community, boxing is in a very good state right now. And we've seen this uh, time and time again, that Deontay Wilder's at the top of the level of the divisions in the heavyweight division. And of course, many other divisions. I think, I think we're always trying to compare boxing to what it was in the seventies and the eighties. It will never be that again, but it is still a good sport with lots of good competition. And you know what? There may be some of the young guns that want to take a shot at Mike Tyson. And I think that would blow the doors off a lot of people, and we'll all watch it. I think well, thinking, is- yeah, I, you're not going to see a Deontay Wilder. You're not going to see a Tyson Fury, Mike Tyson fight, I'm convinced. Because, like, th- let's be honest, Tyson is now 54, as we said. He's not going to be fighting for the heavyweight championship. But are there a bunch of 25-year-old guys who are middling but active heavyweights who would happily take that fight? Uh, I think there's unquestionably those guys. And Rick, having seen what I saw in the highlights afterwards, I don't know that Tyson wins, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't embarrass himself. Yeah, I think there would be some intrigue in that too, but I think boxing fans would more would want to watch Tyson and Holyfield again or Tyson and Douglas because there's that emotional connection to those two guys. So whether it's Tyson versus some 25-year-old hanger-on in the boxing world, uh, there's a little bit of intrigue, but I think boxing fans in general would want to see the two old guys go at it again. It'll go. I just don't like it. What a sour puss. I yeah. can't, but I, can't help, but I, I love the small and, 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 and Bubba's right. It'll never be the same as it was, but really the heavyweight division compare, uh, 
hasn't been the same for a long, long time. As good as the fighters are, there hasn't been any magnetism, uh, real magnetism, not compared to, to, and this is often the case in the history of boxing, those, those classic uh, middle uh, uh, junior welter, welter and uh, lightweight, where, where the really, uh, we'd all admit, that's where the very best boxing takes place in my mind. You know, this, this, this kind of reminds me, and I know he wasn't 54 years old, but it is kind of relative of the time. And in the late 80s, when George Foreman said he was going to return to the ring, right? Now, remember, this is at a time when, you know, he was in his 40s, right? And, and, and a lot of people thought it was a joke. Mm-hmm. They really did when he made this comeback. And he was heavy. And he slowly started to cut, cut his weight and became a serious, you know, he fought for the heavyweight championship, lost, and then won one title. So I don't know if we're going to see this again, but I feel like this is, could be history happening all over again, but in a different time. And then he um, sold a million grills. Right. right. <laughs> okay. That was his key to the lovable. That's how he changed to lovable. Yeah, uh, that, that, was the, that was the key factor in that. That was his yeah. rebirth, yeah. yeah. That and naming all 19 of his children George Jr. Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty good, too. <laughs> I have argued somewhat jokingly, but somewhat not it, it, for a long time now, that one way that we could really show the greatness of Olympic athletes is by somehow having an ordinary Joe also compete in the event, not live, but even now with technology to superimpose them running the hundred. So you would see Usain Bolt and the average guy, and you would see, because with no context, you can't tell how great these players are and these athletes are. Rick, we saw, though, a perfect example of why my idea, I think, is a good one last week in the NFL when the Denver Broncos had to play a non-quarterback. And we really got to say, and this guy had played quarterback before, we really got to see how great the quarterbacks are who play that position all the time. The Denver Broncos, yes. If, if you know, you're watching this and you didn't know that uh, you know, there was a COVID outbreak among the quarterbacks with Denver, so all four were basically ruled out against uh, the New Orleans Saints uh, last weekend. And Kendall Hinton, who, yes, played quarterback at the NCAA before you know, switching over to receiver, was thrust into the spotlight. And he was horrible, expectedly so. One for nine, 13 yards, didn't do anything. Um, and it serves Denver right, number one, for not following COVID protocols, and this is what you get. But number two, yes, it does shine a huge spotlight on how specialized, especially at the quarterback position, they are and how truly extraordinarily talented they are, not only in executing plays, but being able to, you know, when when the poop hits the fan to improvise and and do things amazingly well. And Kendall Hinton did not do that, but it does show us how special these athletes are. There's another angle to this, too, uh, um, and then I realize I'm straying off of Scott's sort of intent of the question. But, but uh, you take a team like Buffalo that has – they're pretty innovative, right? They've won every single one of their games by 10 points or less or fewer, 10 points or fewer. And part of it is because they've had some innovation. One of the innovations that hasn't struck them yet, but that they've been ready for since day one, their fourth quarterback that's on the, ros- that's on the practice roster has never sat in the quarterback's meetings. He's not there for the film rooms. He's not there for anything else. He does it on his own. Why? In case the very thing that happened – uh, to Denver was going to happen uh, to them. They started this right from the start. So I think preparation, this show, this also shows preparation on various staffs, people that are able to think ahead to what, the, nobody knew what this was going to look like when they, when they went into it. So well, there, was good guessing, there was good, there was good, there were good but predictions, sure, there were good predictions, there good predictions but nobody knew what would, what would, what would come down. So the teams that have taken and the, the real, not only the, the precautions, but the, the further thinking ahead, the further roster planning. And I, I would, I would put Buffalo in there. They haven't had to use it yet, but if they do, they've got a guy who, 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 who plays quarterback and is not, and hasn't been at risk. So he hasn't, he hasn't come to in contact with any of the other players. This was a tough situation, guys. I mean, I mean, Kendall Hinton, I believe with a couple of more days of preparation would have probably shown himself much better. He had mm-hmm. one day. Right. I mean, I don't care if you played quarterback. I don't care if they had signed a guy, a veteran, say, like uh, McCowan or something like that, a guy off the street. He would have probably not done much better with one day. of. And, you know, and as we all know, as we've covered the Tiger Cats, that one day is your walkthrough. So it really wasn't any time for this guy to get acclaimed. 
I mean, he was probably studying the playbook more than anything else. And they were running gadget plays and flea flickers and reverses. And I mean, there just wasn't enough time because the guy understands the, the, the position. He's played it as in the NCAA at it, and was apparently very good. So this guy was this was this. I mean, this was a desperation move. Of course. And really, yeah. I mean, hey, and the one pass he completed was a screen pass. Yeah. I agree with you, Bubba, that Bob McCowan would not have done any better if you had put him in the game. Sorry, you meant Bob McCowan, right? <laughs> Um, Listen, you, well, you could have given him, you can give him two months and he would have maybe gone two for 16. You know, prime example, uh, Robert Griffin III, backup quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens, has been with the team all season long. He gets thrust in because Lamar Jackson has to sit because of the COVID-19 outbreak in Baltimore. And he goes, what, six for 12 for 33 yards. And here's a guy who's been a quarterback in the league for four, five, six years. Uh, it, it, there's it, such it a huge shows. drop off from short starter to, to second string. Well, it just shows, and this was sort of the point, it just shows the elite athletes when you, when you're in when there's no context because you're always you're completely surrounded by other elite athletes it's hard to tell how great these people are how fast Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps are or how talented LeBron James is I mean we can see that he's the best player in basketball but when everybody is 66869 six, six, and athletic it doesn't stand out as much as when you put someone in the middle you drop someone in who isn't that and you say see when you're sitting at home, it's maybe not quite as easy. Maybe you couldn't, having played high school football, say, I could do that. No, yeah. you couldn't. The perfect Dude. example came last, I think it was February. David Ayers, emergency yes. goalie for the Carolina Although Hurricanes. that worked. Comes in. Well, he stole the show, didn't he? But you could see, talent-wise, he was kind of shaky, but they still got the job done. Yeah, and the longer, to me, the longer, well, that game was – was there for for them a little early, right? But I mean, the longer it goes on, the more it shows. The 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 more that Radley's point becomes very very obvious because you can get away with a few things. I mean, there's because there are are ten other players on the field, right? That are that are competing against each other. So uh, and the running game. I mean, this isn't the same as Tom Maddy coming in uh, for the Baltimore Colts way back when, and that old people won't understand that. But that's what led to the first, uh, big Super Bowl, which was Joe Namath and, and, uh, Matty was a, was a, was a position player, but he had all season to prepare. I think preparation's a really good point that, that you're all making. Well, today I have the honor of our weekly one minute debate and I will get things going. I am the quiz master for these other three fellas. So I will begin with the question, who is the greatest wrestler of all time? You Let's mean start pro with wrestler, Rodrigo. right? You mean pro, pro wrestler, wrestler, not Greco-Roman? <laughs> We're not going to the Olympic or the Greco. We're not going back to 1800 or 1700 for this. Mm. But let's go to the, what, the squared circle and let's get things going, folks. Three, two, one. The greatest wrestler of all time is the nature boy, Ric Flair. There's no doubt about it. A 16-time world champion. The arm bar, the leg lock, the, the flowing hair, the ladies, the Rolex watches, the leather shoes. This guy had the complete package. And not only was he a master in the ring, probably the best orator in sports for all time. Let's think about it. Who could excite 25,000 people at Tim Horton Stadium with a single woo This guy was outstanding, folks. I mean, and he's lasted the test of the time. And on top of that, too, his daughter is now the world champion for females. This is incredible. I mean, one of a kind kind of guy. I don't think there's anyone in the world that stacks up as best as the nature boy, Ric Flair. Woo! Wow, in under the time, too. Oh, you want me to go here so that there, there, you, you know how much little time you have left? Please do. <laughs> you start, and you guys let me, so I'm going to look right at you. When you when you hold your hands up, I'm supposed to, you're, that's how much time I have left, right? Is that how it works? Something like okay. that, yes, yes. Okay. okay, three, two, one. Now, I don't know how many people have heard of this guy, but it's Bobo Brazil. Uh, Bobo Brazil uh, didn't never filled a, an, an arena of 60,000, uh, but what he could do is uh, fully entertain a, a, an arena of uh, 60 people in a shopping mall to 
15,000, say, at the old Maple Leaf Gardens. He was part of that touring show that uh, worked uh, the United States and Canada uh, in, in wrestling's first great wave, which was post-war, uh, with people in there with, with uh, what was inappropriately called at the time midget wrestling, um, which had uh, Fuzzy Wuzzy and Little Beaver and all of those guys in it, Bruno and, and, and uh, who else, Yukon, Eric, uh, and all sorts of uh, types of things. And he played various roles. I saw him in several different places, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he were still alive if I didn't see him fighting out here on Aberdeen Avenue right now. <laughs> well, um, and Steve comes in under time. I mean, that's making up for last week, I so suppose. I, but well, I, sorry. <laughs> All right, Rick Zamperin. All right. Three, two, one, go. There have been some tremendous wrestlers over the years, and, you know, Bubba and Steve have mentioned a couple of them, but I don't think they're number one on the chart. It has to be. I mean, it has to be Hulk Hogan. How can it not be the Hulkster? How can it not be Hulkamania? I mean, this guy was and still is a phenomenon. He inspired a generation, generations of wrestling fans to hop on board and take their vitamins and, you know, work their hardest <laughs> and listen, <laughs> vitamins. And listen, you know, he fought them all, whether it was Andre the giant and they body slammed him in WrestleMania. He took on Macho Man Randy Savage, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and he beat them all. And not only that, he was not only one of the best good guys of all time, he was probably one of the best bad guys of all time. When he went to the NWO and he started a whole new thing, Hulk Hogan, the Hulkster, number one all time in the squared circle. Uh, he never did the Coco Bonk like Bobo did. Yeah, and he only oh, had one. And he only had one move: the leg drop. Leg drop. How can you no, get no, 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 no. He also had the, this move, Bubba. The, this one, the. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I liked his vitamins. He made vitamins yeah. very, very, very popular and yeah. almost acceptable, didn't he? And Thank saving you, your prayers and uh, yeah, doing all that other stuff. So, all right, here we go. I will. Um, three, two, one. The right answer, of course. Is Coco Beware the Birdman? <laughs> uh, no, my my vote would my vote would normally as a Hamilton guy would go for Iron Mike Sharp, Canada's greatest yes, athlete. Yes. I'll throw in that one as a little nod. But the truly greatest wrestler of all time is Andre the Giant, who uh, was not just physically unbelievable. He was Andre the Giant was the guy that you, if you were a wrestling fan, would go to watch not even necessarily to see him wrestle, but just because you wanted to see him in person. Cause he really was, you know, wrestlers all the time. They announced for a while there, they would announce Hulk Hogan at six foot nine, 480 pounds. And he's like six, three and two fifty. I mean, he's a big guy. Andre the giant was legitimate. And Andre the giant also, the other thing that was great about him, Hulk Hogan tried to branch into movies. He did a Christmas movie. He did like a nanny movie or something, a babysitting movie. He was awful. Andre the Giant. Anybody want to put up in Princess Bride? He was great as pheasant. So how do you not take the entirety of his thing and say Andre the Giant is the greatest of all time? And I just pulled the Steve Milton because I just ran over. Well, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, and I think we should acknowledge here that, uh, A, that documentary on Andre the Giant, great. which was incredible. Great. Incredible. But he was also a very close friend of Angelo Moscas. Yeah. yeah so, as was Ric Flair. As, and, Ric as Flair. was Flair. And then there's a couple of incidents that uh, Angelo talks about. And I think one or two that he wrote in the book that are uh, whoa, pretty questionable about him and him and Andre when they were on tour together. So another local reference. Let's let's not forget uh, the, the great Angelo. From what we hear from those documentaries, almost everything Andre did on tour was a little questionable. Mm. <laughs> Uh, guys, thanks for thanks for doing this, folks. Thanks for watching. Our Twitter handles are on the screen at the end. Get in contact with us. We would love to hear from you. And let me throw out a challenge as well. If you're out there watching this, send us your one-minute debate. Take this topic that Bubba just threw out there, best wrestler of all time, and send it to us. You can send it to the Twitter handle. Send it as a DM, whatever you want to do. Film your best one-minute debate about who was the greatest wrestler of all time. If we get some great ones, maybe we'll throw them on the next week's one as an addendum, a little epilogue on the end, fan reaction, fan interaction. Let us know. Send us one. We'd love to do it. We'll talk to you again soon. Have a great week.